right, let's take our Bibles this evening and turn to the book of the Revelation, to the 21st chapter, almost to the end of the Bible here, Revelation chapter 21. And tonight we're going to be looking at the New Jerusalem. And it's amazing that the old Jerusalem right now is in the news, as uh, President Trump has recognized publicly that he, he views Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And the, tr the truth is, uh, it doesn't matter what he does, God's already viewed that <laughs> as the capital of Israel. And God, uh, that's his land, he gave it to his people, that's the city of David, and that's where he'll rule and reign from one of these days. And so people often wonder, was the Bible really, it's such an old book, listen, <laughs> this book is so up to date and accurate, it, it's, uh, it can't be anything other than the very word of God. Well, I want to speak to you tonight on shopping for a new home. Anybody ever gone shopping, looking at houses and this kind of stuff and watch? Uh, uh, it's an experience. Uh, you have to go and you have to, there's all kinds of things you look at when you go buy a new home. You want to look for the, a lot of people want to know what kind of acreage comes with the house. If I buy this house, is there a, you know, is there, do I get an acre? Do I get 10 acres? Or what, you know, what do I get? And then square footage. How, how big is this house in, in, Jap in Japan? It's how many su subon? Subo? Subo. Subo, something like that. How, how many square feet does this thing have? Uh, you might want to know how many bedrooms does it have? Has it got three bedrooms, two bedrooms? I've got a big family. I'm looking for a bigger. How many bathrooms? Half bath. All these things. Does it have a basement? Is the basement finished? Uh, you know, where is this thing located? And, um, you know, that's what. People say that, you know, the really the, the important thing in real estate is, uh, number one, location, and number two, location, and number three, the most important thing is location, and those are the big three things uh, for selling real estate, apparently. Come on, liven up, folks. We're having fun here, amen. Right All right. But don't, All right. Th those are things you look for when you're going to buy a new home, but tonight, we're going to look at the scriptures and this new Jerusalem, if you're saved... If you have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life because, not of your good works, not of your baptism, not because you joined the church, but because you trusted in the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and He rose again as payment for your sin, this is your home we're looking at. And this is a beautiful home you're going to see tonight. And so let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in, a, in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city. Now, time out. I thought he said he was going to show me the wife. But then it says he's going to show me a, he showed me a city. What's he talking about? Well, the wife, we know, is, is the church. That's the bride of Christ. That's, that's us. Um, so what is it here, preacher? Is this, a, is this a people group or is this an actual city? Well, I read this literally as well we should. We should read this literally. And it's talking about, the answer is not an either or, it's, it's both and. For example, cities can be buildings and cities also are people. If I say to you, Chicago is a beautiful city, you immediately know I'm talking about the location being right there uh, on, on the Great Lakes, and you know the beautiful, you, you think about the beautiful skyline and the, and the buildings, and yeah, boy, it's pretty. But if I say this, Chicago is a wicked city, you immediately know he's not talking about buildings and streets, he's talking about the people that are very, you know, they're high uh, gun violence in, in that city. Um, so, what we understand here, what we're looking at, this is going to be the place where this is your home, but this is also a real place with real buildings and with real uh, dimensions, that kind of stuff. So, so we're going to see a real city. Uh, that great city, verse number 10, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was likened to a stone most precious even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the twelve gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. 
on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, <clears throat> and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four uh, cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And the building of the wall was a, uh, of the wall was a wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. So let's have a word of prayer this night and we'll look at what awaits us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this glimpse of the new Jerusalem, this beautiful city that you have prepared for us, Lord, for those of us who, by your grace, can have a relationship with you through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this promise and this privilege that is ours tonight. Help God where we can't. If somebody's here that's not saved, uh, Father, I pray that they'll see your glory revealed and that they will trust you tonight and have a home in this place. God, for those of us who are saved, I pray that you might just encourage our hearts uh, calmly and just mm, soothe any hurting hearts this evening, Lord, and, and draw us closer to you by revelation of, man, what, what awaits for the believer. God, help us tonight, we do pray. Holy Spirit, I, I just yield myself to thee. I want to be used uh, to honor your word this evening that we might be strengthened. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Amen. Well, uh, the point of the message tonight is simply this, your eternal home, if you're saved, if you're saved, if you're saved, your eternal home is brilliantly magnificent. It is something special. You say, preacher, what's so great about it? Well, uh, let's look at three selling points. If we're going to sell this house tonight, let's pretend we're house hunters and we're going to go look and see what it's all about. But uh, three selling points. Selling point number one, uh, you always want to know what kind of square footage. When you go buy a home, you always look and say, now what kind of square footage? Has it got 1,500 square foot? Is this 1,000 square foot? Is this 2,500 square feet? How big is this place? And so when we go and we look at what God has prepared for us, uh, we see this city. And uh, remember, this is a literal city. Uh, this is a description of the New Jerusalem. It's of an actual material, literal city. And so uh, the city has a wall, um, and the wall there in verse number 17, and he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. So 144 cubits. <clears throat> a cubit typically meant the measurement from the tip of your finger to your elbow, which is about 18 inches. So 144 times 18 gives you, anybody want to do the math? I'll do it for you. 216 feet. That's how thick, this is not the height. This is the thickness of the wall. So we're not talking about height. We're talking about thickness. 216 feet thick. That's how thick these walls are. Uh, and then, what about the, the um, it's 12 furlongs? The city is 12 furlongs. Look at what it says there on 12,000 furlongs, verse number 16. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So you can do the math. A furlong is 660 feet. What does your Bible say? An eighth of a mile. Right, about 220 yards, 660 feet. Trust me, brother. No, 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 I said feet. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Yeah, about 660 feet, 12,000 times 660 feet gives you roughly, uh, I can't remember, I wrote it down somewhere, but miles, 1,500 miles long. That's how big this city is. 1,500 miles Long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. Uh, it's, it, <laughs> I, you can go and Google the New Jerusalem, size of the New Jerusalem. They've done some maps on, and they'll like, place that area size on um, different parts of the globe. 
Basically, it, a city that size would cover Australia, the entire continent <laughs> kind of thing. It's, it's massive. So what kind of size is this? Well, uh, it's been calculated. It is 1,875,000,000 cubic miles. Huge. Absolutely huge. Atlanta to Phoenix, Phoenix into Canada would be <laughs> something. And then extending up into outer space. That's the size of this place that God has prepared. See, Jesus was a carpenter a Nazareth. And men build cities all the time. Don't you think God can build a greater city? <laughs> he absolutely can. So this city that we're talking about, how, how, what's the square footage? How, how big is it? 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Uh, it's going to be an amazing uh, city. It's got uh, the wall. It's 216 foot, feet thick. Uh, the wall's foundation, the Bible tells us, has the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb right there. It says, uh, verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. You know, that's, uh, that, that, those apostles, they're the ones who laid the foundation, amen. I mean, Christ laid the foundation, but those apostles built upon it through their hard work. And, and for all eternity, we will be reminded, you'll see their names in that wall, in that, in that wall, those uh, foundation uh, in that wall. They laid the foundation with hard work. The wall, uh, the foundation, let's look at the foundation here, uh, verse number 19. The foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, fourth emerald, and so forth. Let me tell you, I don't know all the colors, but I'll give them to you as I've studied them. I mean, they're, you can't really be like, this I am 100% sure is all how they're all correct. But I'll give you the 12 of them. A jasper is something like a diamond. A sapphire is like sky blue. Chalcedony is grayish blue. These are the, this is what the foundation will look like. The emerald is green. Sardonyx is kind of a white stone with red in it. A sardis, they say, is blood red, crimson. Chrysosolite, yellowish gold. Burl is sea green. Topaz is yellowish with a green tint. Chrysosporasis is gold with a green tint. Jacinth is violent, uh, uh, violet, <laughs> Violet, reddish, blue, and amethyst is deep purple. So that's the foundation. When you see this place, it's going to be like, whoa, that's beautiful. That is a beautiful, uh, beautiful city. Uh, had a wall. So this is what, you know, this city is going to be like that. Um, Twelve gates. And then, we, did we read that? Yeah. Twelve gates, all pearls. Each gate's going to be a pearl. Now, if you study or you know about pearls, anybody know how a pearl is formed? How's a pearl formed? Uh, and then what happens? Yeah, so like an oyster gets a piece, just a grain of sand, right? And then it irritates, and that oyster has to suffer, and it irritates but that oyster covers it, and out comes a beautiful pearl. And let me tell you something. That's a, that's, we're going to be reminded all eternity as we walk in through these gates of pearl, these pearly gates. I think two things. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for us. We'll see those pearls, and we'll be reminded that a pearl only comes about through suffering. And that's going to lead us to think about Jesus Christ. He suffered in our place. But also to make you think about the church, because here we are. <laughs> Nothing but a little piece of sand. But God suffered for us and He clothed us in His own righteousness and He made us His building. He made us His bride. He made us His body. When we see those pearls throughout eternity, we'll be reminded of the preciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That'll be good. Every time we'll see these stones, we'll see the foundation, we'll see this city, we'll enter the city. Uh, it, it's just going to be a... <laughs> A magnificently brilliant place. It just you can't really enter into how wonderful it's going to be. Uh, it's huge. That's the size of it. But then you say, preacher, uh, we see the size of the city. But next time when we go look at a house, we want to know: Does it have a wow factor to it? 
Like when I pull up and I see this house, does it, does it pop? Does it have something that says, ooh, I like the way that looks? What's the wow factor? Well, the city that we're talking about, the home for the saved, it has an extraordinary wow factor. This city is made of pure gold. Pure gold. Look what it says there. Come on down. Um, verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So this place is going to be wow. Uh, we're going to see it, and uh, it has that wow factor. It has the glory of God in it. This city is going to be pure gold. The streets are pure gold, transparent. And there's not going to be any sun there. There's not going to be any uh, moon. There's no, no need for light because the glory of God is the light of this whole city. You know, I, I love to look at lights and, and, and you know, if you ever go skiing or whatever and the sun hits that and it's, it hits the snow and you talk about bright. I mean, you have to shield your eyes. But in this place, I just can't imagine the glory of God and the throne of God and of the Lamb is right in the middle of it. And this whole city, 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500 miles, is pure, transparent gold. And uh, I mean, you, you talk about wow. <laughs> it's it's going to be it's going to be wow. There's not going to be any temple in it. It says there in verse 22, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Back in the Old Testament, that temple, everything that that temple had represented something for Jesus Christ. For example, the gate to enter the temple was significant of the door, Jesus Christ. Uh, the altar spoke of the cross. The laver where you'd wash your hands spoke of the cleansing of the Word of God. The inside in the, in the holy uh, place, you had the table of showbread. That speaks of the bread of life. You have the candlestick on the other side. That talks about the light of the world. You enter the altar of incense. That's the interceding ministry of the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. You go on into the holy of holies, and then there is the ark of the covenant, which speaks of the blood redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the linen that was used to, um, to we, was woven and, and used in here speaks of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The brass that was used speaks of the judgment that he bore on our part. The gold that they used spoke of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The silver spoke of his blood. The wood that they used spoke of his humanity. Uh, that temple spoke of Christ, but when we get there, we won't need any of that because he himself <laughs> will be there. He will be the light. When we reach the new Jerusalem, we will not need all these, for there we will have him. No light. The Lamb is the light. So picture, in your mind, I mean, just, I, I try to paint the picture for you. You're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And then you're going to have this new Jerusalem, this city, that's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. It's going to kind of come down and hover in the sky. And this thing is going to be so incredibly bright because of God is in there. And the city is pure gold. There's not going to be any sun. This city that you and I are going to live in, this will light the whole earth. I just think that's beautiful. Because you're going to have people on earth. You're going to have the nations. We'll, we'll read that in just a second. But you're going to have people walking on earth of different nations. You'll have Israel in Jerusalem. But then you'll have this beautiful city where you get to live because you're a member of the church. Because you're not an Old Testament saint, you're not a millennial saint, you're not a tribulational saint. You have been privileged by the grace of God to live in the church age and it, those who trust Him make up His body, make up the bride of Christ. And this place is prepared for you. It would be a wonderful place. But imagine seeing that city. And some people ask, is this, well, preacher, it could be a pyramid. 
could be a pyramid. It's all sides equal. It doesn't have to be a cube. But my preacher, what do you say, Brother Tim? Right, which means all sides equal. And a pyramid, all sides can be equal. My preacher, and he's a wise man, he said pyramids in the Old Testament always spoke of paganism. But the ark and the temple and the holy of holies was a perfect cube. So he thinks, based on that, that this is not going to be a, ten, a, a pyramid. This city is going to be a perfect cube, uh, a nice cube square, and it's going to be pure gold, pure gold, <laughs> with the glory of Jesus Christ, the brightness. <laughs> and he will light the entire earth, the new earth, the new heavens and the new earth. This city will be magnificent, and that's where you're living. It's where you're going to be living for eternity. The, the square footage is amazing. The wow factor is like, wow, <laughs> that is a place to live. But then, you know, the other thing that we always ask about, um, I, I do anyway, and a lot of people do, when you go to buy a house, you want to know, what kind of neighborhood is this in? Wh who's, who, who are my neighbors? What kind of people live around here? I need to know that before I decide to move into this place. But when we, let's find out what the neighbors are going to be like in, in this city. Who's going to be your neighbors? Well, uh, it says down there, verse 27, chapter 21, verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's who's going to be in the city. Saved people. Saved people. That's who's going to be here. You have to, and this is a good preaching point, you have to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you want to go here, if you want this to be your eternal home, there is either heaven, the New Jerusalem, or the Lake of Fire. Preacher, I don't want to go to the Lake of Fire. I want this to be my eternal home then you have to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Plain and simple. God could not be more clear. And I ask you tonight, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's a question only you can answer. I can't answer that for you. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If there's come a time in your life where you've said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I can't earn my salvation. And right now, I ask that you save my, I believe you died for me. Would you please save me? Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But if you're one who says, well, I, you know, God's good and all, but I, I've been pretty good in my life too. I pretty much, I, I'm not perfect, but I pretty much, I'll, I'll go there. Your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, I joined a church. That does not, that's not how you get your name written. Well, I was baptized as an infant. That doesn't get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But I promised that I was going to, you know, later on in life, I was going to do something for God. That's not, you don't get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life that way. It only gets written down when you, like a child, believe in Jesus Christ that, and Him alone, that He died in your place. So I ask you this evening, very serious question, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Look at verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. They're going to be on earth. The nations, God's... I think God's a God of variety. I mean, I look around at the room tonight. He doesn't want us all to be the same. He created us to be different. I believe that glorifies God. He likes variation. He likes to make us how we are. And in the apparently there's going to be nations still in the, the eternal state. There's going to be nations. I believe you're going to have the, uh, you know, the South Americans that were saved. They're going to be in South America. I believe that Israel, 
they're going to be a restored people. They'll be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. I believe those Old Testament people who were saved and were out of Moab and some were out of these different places, I believe they're going to be the Gentile nation walking on the Gentiles. And they're going to walk in the light of that city. <laughs> and that's where you and I get to live. Where there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're all one in Christ. It's a special, it is special to be a part of the church. That's why I don't understand people who don't want to get involved in a local New Testament church. It is a privilege. God has privileged you to be a part of this. That's, I mean, that ought to say, thank you, God, what can I do in a local New Testament Baptist church? How can I best serve you? Strong argument there for me, because, I mean, man, God's blessed us. <laughs> he's, given, he's built us our own city. What are we going to do in heaven? Well, it doesn't tell us everything, but it does tell us uh, that we're going to serve. Look at chapter 22 and <clears throat> verse number, we'll just read chapter 22, verse number 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither the light, neither light of the sun, for the Lord... God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What are we going to be doing in heaven? I don't know everything, but I know two things the Bible teaches us right there. We're going to be serving Him. You, you will serve the Lord in this place. Preacher, how are we going to serve Him? That I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Some people speculate that he's going to have certain tasks for us to do, missions that we travel to other solar systems and do stuff. I don't know. Who knows? It doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say. But it does say that we will serve him uh, while we're there. I like what um, one writer said. He said, we are not told what our service will be, nor do we need to know now. It is sufficient that we know what God wants us to do today. We're going to serve him then. How are you going to serve I don't know. What we need to know and concern ourselves with, serve him today. Serve him today. And I'll, I'll have, what, what are, how can I serve God? I'll give you these five things I always do. Number one, read your Bible every day. Read your Bible. Number two, pray every day. Pray. Spend time in prayer. Number three, uh, attend church regularly. When the brethren gather together, you ought to be among them. God said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but so much the more. Exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. I mean, when God's people gather together, it's Sunday morning, we meet here at 10, you ought to be here. We meet here at 11, you ought to be here. We, you came tonight, praise the Lord. It's, we meet here at 6 o'clock on Sunday night, you're here, praise the Lord. We're going to meet again on Wednesday night at 7, you ought to be here. You ought to just make up your mind, God is helping me, I'm going to be at church when the doors are open. Amen. Read your Bible. Pray. Go to church. Tithe your income. You ought, to, you ought to be tithing your income. If God has blessed you and has given you an income, you ought to tithe that. And, and by a tithe, I, I mean a tenth. So if, if you work a job and you make $4,000 a month, you ought to give 400 at least <laughs> 400 to the Lord. That would be a tenth. And then, you do that and watch what God does for you. I'm just telling you. I don't give to get, but I'm telling you as a pastor, and I have before I was a pastor, I always tithe my income. That's one of the things my dad taught me. Tithe your income, and I always did. And let me tell you, God has always taken care of me. Always. And if I'm being honest, He's blessed me way more than... I mean, I... And that's how God is. You, you spoon it to God and he shovels it back on you. I remember when I was in the military and I got a TDY. 
and I was supposed to go TDY, but we had Mark Rogers coming, the evangelist. And I made a deal with God. I said, God, if you'll get me out of this TDY, because I really wanted to hear Mark Rogers preach. I wanted to be here. I said, God, if you'll get me out of this TDY, uh, I'll promise I'll give whatever money I make from the TDY to the church. And you know what God did? God's serious. If you want to be in church, he'll make a way. I didn't go on that TDY, but I ended up going to the next one. And so God took care of his deal, and I, I think I got $600 or some extra for going that TDY. And I gave it to the church. I said, Lord, you, you took care of me, I'm going to do it for you. And it wasn't, <laughs> I don't know, a few days later, but somehow $800 came back my way. Because you can't outgive God. You just can't do it. And the only way I can tell you is, you got to try it yourself. How will I know, preacher? <laughs> Tithe and see. Put God to the test. He says, prove me now. God's in heaven saying, try me out. Check me out. See what happens. Just see what happens. So I would encourage you, tithe your income. Read your Bible. Pray. Go to church. Tithe your income. And then finally, tell somebody about Jesus. To be a witness. Invite someone to church. Pass out a gospel tract. On Saturday, come sing with us. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to sing uh, beautiful Christmas songs and pass out gospel tracts. Be a witness. That's what God wants you to do right now. What are we going to do in heaven? I don't know what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to serve Him in heaven, and praise God, it's going to be good. I don't know what we're going to do then, but I know right now that's what God wants. I know for sure that's what God wants me to do right now. So may we be busy about doing that now. But then also there's a second thing in there, not only going to serve, but it says they shall reign forever and ever. Somehow, some way, we're going to be reigning with him. Now, you don't reign over nothing. <laughs> you know, a kingdom speaks of a king with subjects. And I don't understand everything, but in heaven, because we will rule and reign with him, somehow we will be um, judging, I know we'll be judging angels. And apparently the, the, those that are on the earth, we will be in some way ruling and reigning with Christ. What a joyous thing. Uh, great neighborhood. <laughs> this is going to be a great neighborhood to live in. I mean, if you're looking for a big place to live, this is a big place. If you're looking for that wow factor, 1,500-mile <laughs> cube of gold with the glory of God shining through transparent with all those foundational stones with 216 feet thick walls with the amethyst and the topaz and the sardis and the glory of God just permeating through that place with the tree of life and a river flowing out of it. Does it have the wow factor? It's got a wow factor like nothing you've ever seen. And then what kind of neighbors am I going to have? Well, your neighbors are going to be those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. So, huh? Yeah, no need for locks. They, they don't shut the gates at all by night. So the question, then, I guess, is, in the bottom line, how much is this going to set me back? What kind of price tag are we talking to buy this place? But that's the good news. It's already been pur purchased for you. God bought this for you. Jesus Christ himself died. And when he did, he secured this place for you. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's going to be a beautiful day. I, I, I'm reminded of when the Queen of Sheba came up to Solomon <clears throat> and she had heard how amazing Solomon was and how amazing Israel was. After she talked with him and listened to all the wisdom, and then she saw the way that his servants dressed, and she saw the way that his servants behaved themselves, and she saw the joy, and she saw the ascent of Solomon who walked up to the temple. The Bible says the Queen of Sheba had no more spirit in her. <laughs> just like her breath was taken away. I just, she said... I heard, but I didn't hear the half of it. And I believe that's how it's going to be with us in heaven. We can read it, and we can somehow try to imagine it with our pitiful, finite minds. But one of these days, 
I believe we'll tell the Lord, I, I read about it, Lord, but I just, I just didn't, I, wow. Wow. Now here's who's gone, those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Plain and simple. And that's the question. That's the application. This all awaits for the person who's trusted Christ. Man, that's, that, that's encouraging. Why doesn't this make a difference in people's lives? Because we get so wrapped up in the day-to-day stuff. We get so focused on our problems, on our trials, on our stresses. We get so focused on this, and sometimes it's good just to get a good look at eternity and see, wow, wow, what a beautiful place. What a wow factor. What great neighbors I'm going to have. I'll take that. How much is the price tag? It's already been paid for. It's been prepared for you, if you'll just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for preparing us this place and, Lord, for writing it down so we could read about it and how just stunning it must be. God, we're thankful that we are promised, those of us who have trusted in you, our our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, we rejoice tonight that we get to come to this place, not of our own merit, but through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if somebody is among us tonight that doesn't know you, I pray right now, Lord, that you might tug at their heart and help them to see their need, help them to see the provision at Calvary, help them to see the eternal abode of the saved people. God, I pray that they would trust you tonight. Please bless now the invitation we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Miss Misako plays softly on the piano, God spoke to your heart this evening. We invite you to come. If you're here and you're not sure that you're saved, we certainly invite you to Christ. God's not willing that any should perish. And perhaps he puts things like this in the Bible so that we read it and it's a motivator for somebody maybe who's not saved. It's either the lake of fire for eternity, after eternity, after eternity, after eternity. The lake of fire. Or the new Jerusalem. And the choice is yours. Choose wisely. I beg you. Come to the end of yourself. Drop all pretense. And simply ask Jesus Christ. Trust Him as your Savior. Trust the God-man, the virgin-born Son of God to be your Savior, to have His righteousness credited to your account. He'll do it. Then, dear Christian, are you struggling? May I invite you just to get a good look at heaven. What a glorious day awaits the child of God, awaits the believer. I know it gets rough sometimes on earth. Things don't go our way. Troubles, trials, sickness, family issues, family problems, job situations. But one day, this is a reality. Whatever the need, we invite you to come.